Okay, let's move to area five. Yeah. All right. Hi, I'm, I'm Dave Staples from Hanover, New Hampshire, and I've got two questions for you. Uh, first, I'd like to hear your thoughts on selling security short and what your experience has been recently and over the course of your career. Uh, the second question I'd like to ask is how you go about building a position in a security you've identified. Uh, using USG as a recent example, I believe you bought most of your short shares at between $14 and $15 a share, but uh, certainly you must have thought it was a reasonable investment at 18 or 19. Why was 14 and 15 the magic number? And now that it's dropped to around 12, do you continue to build your position? How do you decide what your ultimate position is going to be? Well, we, 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 we can't talk about any specific security, so our, our, our buying techniques depend very much on the kind of security we're dealing in. Sometimes uh, it's a security that might take many, many months to acquire, and other times you can do it very quickly, and sometimes it may pay to pay up, and other times it doesn't. And, and the truth is you never know exactly what the right technique is to use uh, as, you're, as you're doing it, but you just use your best judgment based on, on, on past purchases, but, but we can't discuss any specific one. Short selling is, is it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, uh, item to study because it's, I mean, it's ruined a lot of people. Uh, it's, it, it is the sort of thing that you can go broke doing. Bob Wilson, there's famous stories about him and Resorts International. He didn't go broke doing. In fact, he's done very well subsequently. But, but being short something where your loss is unlimited is quite different than being long something uh, that you've already paid for. Uh, and it's tempting. You see way more stocks that are dramatically overvalued in your career than you will see stocks that are dramatically undervalued. I mean, they're... they're it's the nature of securities markets to occasionally promote various things to the sky so that securities will frequently sell for five or ten times what they're worth and they will very, very seldom sell for 20% or 10% of what they're worth. So it, therefore, you see these much greater discrepancies between price and value uh, and on the overvaluation side. So you might think it's easier to make money on short selling. And all I can say is uh, uh, it hasn't been for me. I don't think it's been for Charlie. It is a very, very tough business because of the fact that you face unlimited losses and because of the fact that people that have overvalued stocks, very overvalued stocks, are fre frequently on some scale between promoter and crook, and that's why they get there. And once they're, and, and they also know how to use that very valuation to bootstrap value into the business because if you have a stock that's selling at 100 that's worth 10, obviously it's to your interest to go out and issue a whole lot of shares. And if you do that, when you get all through, the value can be 50. In fact, there's a lot of chain letter type stock promotions that are sort of based on the implicit assumption that the management will keep doing that. And if they do it once, and build up to 50 by issuing a lot of shares at 100 when it's worth 10. Now the, now the value is 50 and people say, well, these guys are so good at that, let's pay 200 for it or 300 and then they can do it again and so on. It's not usually that quite that clear in their minds, but that's, that's the basic principle underlying a lot of stock promotions. And if you get caught up in one of those that is successful, you can, you know, you can run out of money before the promoter runs out of ideas. In the end, they, they, they almost always work. I mean, I, I would say that of the things that we have felt like shorting over the years, the batting average is very high in terms of eventual, uh, they, they would work out very well eventually if you held them through. But it is very painful, and it's, it's in, our, in my experience, it's a whole lot easier to make money on, on, on the long side. I had one situation, actually an arbitrage situation when I was in, was when I moved to New York in 1954, so it was in about June or July of 1954, that involved a surefire type transaction, an arbitrage transaction that had to work. But there was a technical wrinkle in it, and I was short something. And I felt like a, for, for a short period of time, I, uh, I was, uh, I felt like uh, Finova was feeling last fall. I mean, it, uh, it was very unpleasant. Uh, 
you can't make, in my view, you can't make really big money doing it because you can't expose yourself to the loss that, that uh, would be there if you did do it on a big scale. And uh, Charlie, how about you? Well, Ben Franklin said if you want to be miserable, you know, during Easter or something like that, he says borrow a lot of money to be repaid at Lent or something to that effect. And similarly, being short something, which keeps going up because somebody is promoting it in a half-crooked way and you keep losing and they call on you for more margin, it just isn't worth it to have that much irritation in your life. Uh, it isn't that hard to make money somewhere else with less irritation. It would never work on a Berkshire scale anyway. I mean, you, you could never do it for the kind of money that that uh, uh, would be necessary to do it with in order to have a real effect on Berkshire's overall value. So it, it's not something we think about. It, it's interesting, though. I mean, it, I've got a copy of the uh, of the uh, New York Times from the day of the Northern Pacific Corner, and that was a case where two opposing business titans each owned over 50% of the Northern Pacific Company, uh, Northern Pacific Railroad. And when two people each own over 50% of something, you know, it's going to be interesting. And Northern Pacific on that day went from 170 to 1,000, and it was selling for cash because you had to actually have the certificates that day rather than the normal settlement day. And on the front page of the New York Times, which incidentally sold for a penny in those days, it's had a little more inflation than Coca-Cola, front page of the New York Times, right next to the story about it, it told about a brewer in New Newark, New Jersey, who had gotten a margin call that day because of this, and he jumped into a vat of hot beer and died. And that's really never appealed to me as, you know, the ending of a financial career. <laughs> Who knows, you know, when, when they had a corner in Piggly, Wig, uh, Piggly Wiggly, they had a corner in Auburn Motors in the 1920s. I mean, there were corners. That was part of the game back when it was played in a kind of a footloose manner. And uh, it did not pay to be short. Actually, during that period, you might find it interesting. In the current issue of The New Yorker, maybe one issue ago, the, the one that has an interesting story about Ted Turner, there's also a story about Hetty Green. And Hetty Green was one of the original incorporators of Hathaway Manufacturing, half of our Berkshire Hathaway operation back in the 1880s. And Hetty Green was just piling up money. She was the richest woman in the, uh, maybe in the world, certainly in the United States, maybe some queen was richer abroad. But Hetty Green just made it by the slow old-fashioned way. I doubt if Hetty was ever short anything. So as, as a spiritual descendant of Hetty Green, we're going to stay away from shorts at uh, Berkshire. Okay, Area 6. Hetty, incidentally, this story, it's a very interesting story. It, it, as I read the story, it's almost conclusively clear to me that she forged a will to try and uh, collect some significant money from, I believe, her aunt. And, uh, and uh, it was a very, very famous trial back in whenever it was, 1860 or 70. And, and uh, uh, they found against Hetty when it got all through, but she still managed to become the richest woman in the country.